Now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Node. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Faber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into our time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. Crime drama Stutz Cutsworth in Casey Crime Photographer. This episode, entitled The Laughing Killer, was originally broadcast May 8, 1947. The Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation brings you Crime Photographer. Bird, what are you reading? Hiya, Casey. I'm just brushing up on the baseball scores. Is that so? I didn't know you were a baseball fan. Oh, sure. I follow the Dodgers every year. Hmm. Who's your favorite team, Casey? Well, I usually root for the Yankees. Uh, How about you, Tony? Who, me? Why, naturally, I root for Anchor Hawking, the most famous name in glass. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Tony Marvin. Every week at this time, the Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation of Lancaster, Ohio, and its more than 10,000 employees bring you another adventure of Casey, crime photographer, ace cameraman who covers the crime news of a great city. Written by Alonzo Dean Cole, our adventure for tonight, The Laughing Killer. <laughs> Midnight, and the Blue Note Cafe is doing its usual brisk midnight business. From the service end of the bar, a waiter beckons to Ethelbert, the head bartender. What do you want, Walter? Uh, the guy at that table by the wall wants another drink, Ethelbert. How about it? He's lit to the eyes. Uh, you better collect his bill and ease him into a cab. Uh, okay. Wait a minute. Huh? His face is familiar. You know who he is, Walter? No, he's a new one to me. Huh, I can't place him, but he's a clean-cut-looking guy. Yeah. See, he gets a right cab, Walter, with a driver you know, huh? Okay, if I can get him out and into a cab. Hi, Ethelbert. Well, Casey. Hello. Evening, Miss Williams. You Hi. two just put the paper to bed? Yeah, nothing to do now. Go home and get some shut-eye. Oh, and how I'll go for that. Oh, I'm tired. You and me both, Annie. Uh, Ethelbert, give me a pack of cigarettes, will you? Same old brand? Sure, same old brand. What do you think? Here. Yeah. Pick up what you need. Why you got a bullet mixed up with that silver? A bullet? Uh, oh. Oh, Captain Logan gave that to Casey today. Yeah. This 32 caliber shell was in an automatic that killed a guy last month, pal. Casey helped Logan get the killer, so that cartridge is to remember him by. A little slug just like that bump someone off, huh? A 32 is big enough when it gets inside you. Oh, don't go into details. I can imagine. I don't want to go home. I uh, look. I want another drink. Please, mister. Oh, no, I don't want to go. One home. of your customers isn't listening to reason, Ethelbert. Uh, uh, Ethelbert, hey. Hmm? Isn't that drunk Artie Maddox? Artie Maddox? Yeah. Sure, I knew I'd seen him before. When did he get out of the big house, Casey? Last month on parole. I meant to look him up, but I haven't had time. You mean that nice looking man is an ex convict? Yeah, and he was sent up for murder, Miss Williams. Well, not quite. That was manslaughter. A lot of doubt that he was guilty even of that, too. Mm, that's so. What? His case was hot news before you come to this town, Miss Williams. Artie Maddox was an orchestra leader. He had one of the best and... sweet bands in the country, Annie. Before he met some dame who calls herself Gypsy Hibbert. Gypsy Hibbert? Oh, the uh, the big uh, blues singer. Oh, that's right. Yeah, you can shorten the gypsy part of her name to plain Gyp. That'd describe her better. Too. What happened? Well, she was singing in a roadhouse, and Artie heard her. He hired her and gave her a feature spot with his band. Then he went nuts about her and wanted to marry her. But she just kind of strung him along in order to meet more important guys. One of which was Phil Blaney. At that time, Annie, five years ago, Blaney was the big shot in the gambling racket here. You mean he had the spot that Luke Carboni has now? Uh huh. Oh. Carboni then was merely Blaney's first assistant. Well, Blaney went for the gypsy gal in a big way. One night, the cops got a phone call from Gypsy who said there'd been an accident in her apartment. When they got there, they found Blaney with a bullet in his head, and Artie Maddox was in the apartment. He said Blaney had pulled a gun on him. 
that there'd been a struggle. The gun went off in Blaney's direction. Of course, Gypsy told the same story. A lot of folks, including the cops, were more than half convinced that it was she who'd really shot Blaney in cold blood. And that Artie Maddox told the story he did to protect her. Yeah. But she came out of the mess undamaged and poor Artie went to jail. And he hadn't been in the big house six months when Gypsy Hibbard married Lou Carboni, who'd fallen hair to Blaney's racket. Nice girl. Yeah. So nice that even a rat like Carboni couldn't stand for her long. They separated a little while afterwards, and Gypsy got a divorce and heavy alimony. Well, Artie Maddox is out on parole now. That's all. I don't want to go home. Except that he won't stay out if the parole board hears he's getting plastered. If those waiters are going to get him out of here, it looks as though they'll have to carry him out. Hey, maybe I could straighten him oh, out. Oh, now, Casey, don't start one of your Boy Scout acts. Huh? Walter will put him in a cab, Casey. Yeah, well, what happens after he's put out of the cab? I'm going over Please there. Go on, I don't want to go home. I now, look say. here, mister. Uh, I... I'll take care of him, Walter. What? You know this guy, Casey? Sure. Remember me, Artie? Ah, uh, sure. You're a cop, ain't you? No. I'm no cop. But you know, it wouldn't be good if a cop saw you right now. A guy on parole is supposed to behave himself. I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm just celebrating something. <laughs> something awful funny that's happened. <laughs> you never guess the funny thing that's happened. Yeah, well, suppose I... I run you home, huh? You tell <laughs> me about it on the way. I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to tell anybody. <laughs> but you... <laughs> You can read about it in the papers tomorrow. Okay, but let me take you home anyway. Now you can read it in the papers. Hey, say, you work on a paper. I remember you now. You're Casey. That's right. Hey, Casey, good old Casey. I'll buy you a drink. Uh, hey, no, hey, no, 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 no. Wait a minute. Hey, wait we'll a have minute. one later. We'll have one later. You got a bottle at home, Artie? Uh, sure, I got a bottle well, at home. Well, that's fine. Suppose you take me there and we'll have a talk about old times. That's huh? hard. I'd like to talk tonight. I'd like to talk. Where are you living? Her Buckingham Apartments. It's uh, 6th Street, number 614. 614. 614. 614. All yeah. right, that's fine. Well, let's go. Then. Yeah. Come on. You're not just trying to get me out of here. Of course not. Come on, pal. Come on. Okay. <laughs> you know, the funniest thing happened tonight, Casey. <laughs> the funniest thing. <laughs> <laughs> Here's where he lives, Annie. Hmm? If I can only get him into his apartment. Did he do? Give you the number before he Yeah, passed? 2B, second floor. All right, here goes. Hey, you're uh, not going to carry him. It's the only way he can be moved. But this uh, is a walk-up place, Casey. The, the stairs. Oh, poor guy isn't heavy. Open the door for me, will you, Annie? Oh, all right, sure. Mm. I'd better come along and help you with the apartment door, too. Yeah, if you don't mind, honey. Gee, this is an awful cheap-looking place. Well, guys don't usually come out of prison heavy with dough. Well, I wonder who's... What's he living on? Dixie Trumbull, a songwriter, was always Artie's closest pal. Yeah. Imagine Dixie's putting him up for... He hasn't been on the chips lately either. Here we are. Here's 2B. Uh, yeah. You have to go through his pockets and find the key. Yeah, yeah. I'll prop him up right yeah. here. Eddie. Funniest thing happened tonight. Why are you snapping out of it, Casey? Uh, funniest thing. Uh-oh. Passed out again. Yeah. I wonder where he carries his yeah. key. Uh, Annie. Hmm? Look at this. <gasps> Automatic pistol. This was in his pocket. Chump's just out of jail on parole. He's toting a cat. Uh-oh. This doesn't look good, Casey. Looks lousy. <laughs> hey, Annie. Yeah? Gun was fired not long ago. Fire? Yeah, smell it. Yeah. Wait a minute. Let's look at the clip. Yeah. One cartridge missing. What do you think? Your guess is as good as mine. Funniest thing happened tonight. Funniest there, thing I found his mine. key. Here, Annie, unlock the door, will you? Yeah, okay. I'm going to snap this guy out of his daze and ask him a few questions. All right, switch on the lights. Oh, yeah. Uh, here we are. How are you going to make him talk? There, there. You find some coffee in that kitchenette, will you, Annie, while I hold this guy up? Yeah. Make a pot of triple strength while you're doing it. I'll be ducking this guy in a cold bath. Okay. All right now, Artie. Uh, come into this bathroom. <clears throat> Get those clothes off you. Uh, funny thing happened tonight. <laughs> Yeah, maybe it won't seem so funny after you hit this cold water. Hey, uh, 
Go out crazy. Don't push my head under. Can you please? All right, Artie. Okay, okay. I think you're on the sober side now. Come on, get out of the tub, put on your clothes. Come out. Yeah. Lady's making some hot coffee. A lady? Yeah, a friend of mine. Oh, I'll leave you alone now. Don't be long. And I want to have a considerable talk with you. Talk? What about? Stay to your help. Get dressed and hurry. Is he okay, Casey? He knows what's going on around him now. Anyway. Did he tell you anything? I haven't mentioned the gun. Let's have another look at that thing. Hmm. Foreign make. 29.5 caliber. It's got a pearl grip on it. It looks like a woman's gun. Yeah. Say, it's funny. Phil Blaney was killed with a fancy little get like this. You mean the man Maddox went to jail for killing? Yes. Kill- the bullet they took out of his head was a 29.5. I remember because it's an unusual caliber for pistol ammunition. Oh. See, in this country, we standardize pretty much on 22s, 25s, and 32s. Like the cartridge Logan handed me today, 38s and 45s. Yeah, you, Casey. What? Someone's trying the outside door. Yeah. Who's there? Open up, we're police. Police? Open up, Maddox, or we'll blast our way in. Hey, that's Sergeant Flanagan's voice. This is the last warning, Maddox. Hold Open everything, up. Flanagan, and I'll let you in. Casey, what are you doing here? Mind if I ask you the same question? We've come to arrest Maddox for murder, that's all. Murder? Who? Gypsy Hibbert. Gypsy? Yeah. She was killed about two hours ago in her apartment. Now then, where's Maddox? Why do you think Maddox had anything to do with it? He was seen leaving the building she lives in. She was shot with the same kind of gap that killed Blaney five years ago. A 29-5 automatic. Hey, Casey, Let me do what? the talking, Annie. The only talk I want to hear right now is the answer to where's Maddox? He's here, Flanagan. Where? In the bathroom. There. Uh-huh. All right, bring him out, Sam. I'll cover you with my gun. Right, Sarge. Hey, Casey, he killed that woman with a gun. Maybe not him. Maybe not him. Don't mention that gun. In the bathroom, Sarge. He's gone. What? Hey, that open window. He must have swung under the fire escape and got away. Casey, you're to blame for him getting away. I am. You stalled me here while he was going out that window. I wasn't stalling you. Well, we'll see what Captain Logan thinks about it. You know, you've got me in a jam, pal. Well, I'll make Logan see you weren't to blame. Where is he? At the late Gypsy Hibbert's apartment, trying to find out just what happened there. Well, let's go. I want to find out what happened at the late Gypsy Hibbert's apartment, too. May 8th, 1947. Casey Crime Photographer on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, more of Casey Crime Photographer, May 8th, 1947. And that's why we were in Artie Maddox's apartment, Logan. That's all we know about him. Uh, when you undressed him before you stuck him in a cold tub, Casey, he didn't run across a gun in his clothes. I, I wasn't looking for a gun. Now, suppose you give Ann and me the lowdown on its shooting, pal. Well, a guy called up headquarters. Uh, wouldn't give his name, but he told us to pick up Lou Carboni and ask him why he'd just killed his ex-wife. Ask Lou Carboni why he'd killed Gypsy Hibbert? Yeah. So two of my men went to Carboni's home. They found him playing poker with three guys who said he hadn't left the house all evening. Hmm. At the same time he was being checked, I came here to Gypsy Hibbert's apartment. Got the super to let me in and... Found her lying on the living room floor with a 29.5 slug in her head. And somebody told you they'd seen Artie Maddox leaving the building. Yeah, the superintendent. And checking the time he saw Maddox leave with the medical examiner's finding, the woman must have been shot just a few minutes before. Have you any idea who made that call to headquarters, Captain? Oh, I think Maddox made it. He killed Gypsy Hibbert because she married another guy, Lou Carboni, after Maddox took the rap for her in that Blaney shooting. Maddox hated Carboni, too, for getting the gal he wanted, so he tries to frame Carboni for the murder he's just committed himself. You know, Carboni wasn't on good terms with his ex-wife. He wasn't seen near this building tonight. Maddox was. A real murderer would take good care not to be seen. Oh, yeah. yeah? Sergeant Flanagan, Captain. Now, come in, Sergeant. Carboni wants to know if he can go now, sir. Carboni's here? Yeah, yeah. I was questioning him in the kitchen before you arrived. I'll talk to him, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Uh, Captain wants you, Mr. Carboni. Captain, it's so late. I uh, wonder... Carboni, you can go home now. But don't leave there without letting me know where I can reach you. Very well. Hello, Carboni. Oh. Hello, Casey. <laughs> Sergeant Flanagan tells me you helped the murderer of my ex-wife make his escape tonight. I don't believe Flanagan told you that. That I didn't, Casey. All I said <laughs> was... Now, don't take me seriously. I was only kidding. 
Doesn't seem like a good time for kidding. You're in a spot, Carboni. What do you mean by that? Can't you figure it? Why, you... Never mind. Go on home, Carboni. I'll see you tomorrow. Okay. Thought you'd better tell Casey about my alibi, Cap. He has told me. It's a very good one. Good night. Oh. Well, Andy and I have been running along too, Logan. It's our bad luck this case had to break too late for a morning paper. <laughs> that is tough, isn't it? And I expect to have Art Maddox under arrest long before your next edition, so the afternoon sheets will get first crack at that news, too. Where do you expect to find Maddox? Well, there's a general alarm out. We'll pick him up. Say, you used to know him pretty well. Maybe you have an idea where he died out. I didn't even know where he lived until after I ran into him at the Blue Note tonight. Come on, Annie. Casey. Let's go, kid. Good night, Logan. All right. Casey, you, you suppressed evidence. And you didn't tell Logan about that gun you found. You were swell, kid. You didn't tell him either. Here's the outside door. But we've got to tell him. Otherwise, we're accessories We won't to... bother with the elevator, Annie. Let's walk down. We're not leaving until you give that gun to Logan. Well, yes, we are. Come on. No. Give him the gun later. After I have a talk with Maddox. Talk with... You know where he find it? I think so. Which makes another little item I've suppressed. Why? Well, let's call it a hunch, Annie. I have a feeling that if the cops find Artie before I do, if they have that gun that seems to clinch his guilt, he hasn't got a chance. And he didn't shoot Gypsy Hibbert any more than he killed Phil Blaney. You think Carboni did it? All I'm thinking of now is locating Maddox. Well, where are you going to look for him? Well, he needs a friend tonight, a dependable friend. His closest pal is that songwriter, Dixie Trumbull. All right, we're heading for Dixie's place. <laughs> I ain't set eyes on Artie for two, three days, Casey. On the level, he ain't here. Oh, listen, Dixie. Miss Williams and I want to help the guy. He needs help. Don't give me a wrong steer. Well, I don't know what you're talking about. And I got no idea where Artie is. It's okay, Dixie. Hello, Artie. Why, you said not to let anyone know you were here. Casey's my friend. Yes. This should convince you of that, fellow. Oh, the gun. I figured you'd found it on me. And Casey didn't tell the police about it. I'll take the shells out of it. Put it here on this table until you tell me what to do with it. What does the gat mean, Artie, and what's the stuff about cops? I haven't told you, Dixie, because the less you know, the less trouble you'll have. I'll go out and take a walk for half an hour. Please, Dixie. Okay, pal. <clears throat> Guess you've got a good reason for asking. I have. That's all I need to know. See you later. I can't have him mixed up in this case. He's too grand a guy. This apartment of his was the only place I knew of to go after I ducked out that bathroom window. I spent five years in prison. I can't go back there. When I heard the cops say he was looking for me, I lost my head. What were you doing at Gypsy Hibbers tonight? You don't think I killed her? I'd have given the cops that gun if I had. I told them to look for you here. Come on, let's have the lowdown. Okay. You know, I was crazy about Gypsy before. Yes, yes, I know. Before. Yeah. Well, after I came out of jail, she wouldn't see me or even talk to me over the phone. Last night, I made up my mind I'd see her. I had to. Then, <laughs> it was funny. It's the funny part we want to hear about. Well, I, I, I sneaked up to her apartment. A guy in the showed me how to pick locks, and I, I sat in the dark waiting for her to come home. Finally, the outside door was opened with a key. It was Lou Carboni. Carboni? Yes, he sat down in the next room and waited in the dark. Then the door opened again. It was Gypsy this time. <laughs> He told her why he'd come to kill her. Then I watched him do it. You watched Why did Carboni kill her? <laughs> it was funny, Casey. It was, it was so funny I couldn't raise a hand to stop him. Come on, hold on to yourself, buddy. What did he say well, to her? She, she'd been blackmailing him, you know, threatening to tell the cops it was really Carboni who killed Blaney. Carboni killed Blaney? And I had, I had taken the rap because Gypsy told, told me she had killed Blaney. She was protecting Carboni then at my expense. Then she married Carboni and they got to hate each other. And tonight... He killed her while I was there to, to watch. <laughs> it wasn't a funny case. It wasn't a funny. Case. <laughs> Come on, Artie. Cut it out. What happened after Carboni shot her? Come on, Artie. Pull out of it. Pull out of it. He wiped his fingerprints off the gun. He put it in her hand to look as though she'd committed suicide. But he didn't know I was watching. Then he let himself out the back way. I realize now it was a crazy thing to do, but I, I picked up the gun. I put it in my pocket. I thought he'd spoil his suicide setup. Then I got out of the place. I phoned the cops to, 
Pick him up. Artie, no jury's going to believe the story you just told us. I know that. But Carboni's not going to be free and alive while I pay for another murder he's committed. What do you mean? I got another gun before I came to Dixie's. You see, I'm going to kill Lou Carboni. Artie, give me that gun. Keep back, Casey. I'm going to kill Carboni today before the cops can find him. Don't be a fool. You just said no jury will believe my story. Give me that gun. May 8th, 1947, Casey, crime photographer on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. The conclusion follows these important messages from your favorite radio station. Classic Radio Theater family, you know our friend Mike Lindell has a passion to help everyone get the best sleep of your life. He didn't stop by just creating the best pillow. He created the best bed sheets ever. They look and feel great, which means an even better night's sleep for me because, you know, I'm working like 67 hours a day. Now, Mike's offering the best deal on this Giza Dreams bed sheets ever. You can get a set of Giza sheets for as low as $29.98. You'll never want to sleep on anything else once you sleep slept on a set of Giza Dream sheets. A special offer for you right now. You can get a set of Giza sheets for as low as $29.98. Call 1-800-928-4715. Use the promo code WYATT or go to MyPillow.com. Use the promo code WYATT. It's good on anything on the website. That number again, 1-800-928-4715. Use my promo code WYATT. I'm Wyatt Cox, this is Classic Radio Theater, and now the conclusion of Casey Crime Photographer, May 8th, 1947. Keep back. You you won't shoot me. Not to kill you. I'll let you have it. He will shoot, Casey, look out. Okay, Eddie. You two get into this clothes closet. I'm sorry, but this is the way it's got to be. It's a foolish way, Artie. It's the only way. No, no, let me go. Don't get me. Give me back a gun. Not a chance. I never figured you for a killer, Artie. You're not going to louse me up by shooting Carboni or anybody else. Thanks, Casey. Hey. Drop the gun you just took from him, Casey. <sighs> Drop it. Carboni. There's nothing else I can do, Carboni. Thanks. Now all of you move back against that wall. You see, Maddox? Like Casey, I figured you'd hide out with Dixie Trumbull. Why did you come here? That gun I planted beside my late wife's body wasn't found there. And I leave nothing to chance. When your bodies are found, Casey, it'll be thought that Maddox killed you and this lady before committing suicide. Mm, Same old gag. The gun to be found in Artie's hand. Same as you met that one on the table to be found in Gypsy's. It's always a good gag before a jury. And I'll use the gun on that table, the one that killed my former wife. Then there'll be no doubt that you did all the shooting, Maddox. Are you... you keep quiet, Artie. He'd better. <laughs> Sweet little gun, this 29.5 automatic. <laughs> Always like these imported gats. Well, you take the first slug from it, Casey. What's wrong? That 29.5 isn't loaded, Carboni. The shells are in my pocket. Give them to me. You can't hold your other gun and load the automatic, too. You can load it. With its barrel pointed at Miss Williams. You can make a single phony move. All right. I know when I'm licked. Take the gun. Put a shell in its chamber first. Okay. Now load the clip. This suits you. Hold the gun by the barrel and slide the clip in. Now what? Put the gun on the table. Don't get your finger near the trigger. There. (laughs) Nice little guns. Those 29 vibes. Get ready to take it, Casey. Okay. I got you and the lady into this, Casey. You'll get the second slug, Maddox. Then Miss Williams. Now, Casey. So long. (laughs) With that shell, Carboni, so long to you. The gun blew up. Yes, it exploded right in his face. Right in his face. Wasn't it funny? Huh. Wasn't it funny? Well, the explanation...
explanation, of course, is very simple, Ethelbert. You see, I... I forced the 32 caliber cartridge Logan gave me yesterday into the chamber of that 29 5 caliber automatic. It wouldn't pass through a barrel that was too small by two and a half hundredths of an inch. You remember, uh, remember, Ethelbert, that inventor's machine gun that blew up because the shells were too large? Yeah. Yeah. The explosion didn't kill Carboni, huh? No. He'll live to go to the chair. And as for Artie Maddox, well, the criminal record he never deserved is being wiped off the books. So he'll just live again. Funny, wasn't it? Yeah. Funny. Very funny. Crime Photographer, starring Stotts Cotsworth as Casey, is brought to you each Thursday by the Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation, makers of Fire King Oven Glass. Anchor Glass Containers, Anchor Caps and Closures, all products of Anchor Hawking, the most famous name in glass. Photographer is directed by John Dietz. The original music is by Archie Blyer, and the program features Miss Jan Minor as Anne and John Gibson as Ethelbert. The part of Maddox was played by Lawson Zerby, and Herman Citizen is the Blue Note pianist. May 8, 1947, Casey Crime Photographer on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, part two of the five-part Yours Truly Johnny Dollar story, The Silver Blue Matter, a story about juvenile delinquency. This episode originally broadcast May 8, 1956. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Red. Red Wallace, remember? Sure, sure. You run that lunchroom across the street from the warehouse that was robbed last night. Yeah, that's right. Now, look, Dollar, supposing I tell you what I know about it, what's going to happen to me? Nothing, as long as you weren't mixed up in it yourself. No, 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 I mean the papers and the cops. If it gets out I talk to you, I won't last 24 hours. I think I can take care of that. What do you know about it, Red? That depends on what it's worth to you. I see. I'll have to sell out, get away from this section, so I'll need some dough. You follow me? All right, I'll see you taken care of. Now, just what is it you... No, 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 it ain't safe. I'm talking from a booth. You stay right there at your hotel. I'll see you in a half hour. Right. Just you, no cops... Yeah. Yeah, that's right, Mr. Beck. Mr. Beck? Yeah, six quarts of milk and two pounds of butter. Sure, right away. Uh, Thanks, Mr. Beck. Goodbye. Hello. Hello. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly... Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Los Angeles, California, to the Home Office, Mono Guarantee Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment The Silver Blue Matter. Expense account continues. Item four, 20 cents, a phone call to my friend Lieutenant Garcia of the L.A. Police and a call to Queen of the Angels Hospital. Albert Chrisman, the night watchman who was slugged by the gang of teenage hoodlums during the warehouse robbery, was still unconscious. And Chrisman, unless Red Weller was ready to talk now, was the only lead I had toward finding $100,000 worth of silver blooming coats. I waited two hours and a half for Red Weller, but he didn't show. <laughs> Item five, two dollars and eighty-five cents. Taxi to the warehouse district at the south end of the railroad yards. It was night by now, and the area was almost deserted. A lost, lonely district, shabby and worn, even in the softening darkness, and haunted now by fear. The only lights in the block were those shining from the windows of the warehouse office and from Weller's lunchroom across the street. Good evening. Hello. What would you like, sir? A cup of coffee, I guess. Oh, you're lucky. 
I just made some fresh. Good. Would you like some cream? No, thanks. No, that'll be fine. Is it foggy out? Yeah, a little. Not bad, though. Hey, this coffee's all right. You're a good cook. Thanks. The boss always has me make it when I'm here. He says I do it better than he does. I'll bet you do. Is the boss around, by the way? No, he he called me and said he had to go out. That's why I'm working. I'm on in the daytime, mostly. Do you have any idea where he might be? No. No, he had to go somewhere, I guess. What'd you want to see him about? He wanted to see me. Do you know where he lives? Well, he's got an apartment over on Marina. It's about eight blocks from here. Think he'd be there? No, he he wasn't going home. He he was going out somewhere. He, he acted kind of strange. I, I don't know what he was going to do. May I may I ask just what business you're in? Insurance. Oh. I'm a special investigator. What do you mean? I'm working for the company that insured those furs. Oh. The furs that were stolen the night before last from the warehouse across the street. Oh. Something wrong? Oh, no. No, of course not. I, I, I don't know what you mean. Oh? Can I help you gather up that silver? Oh, no, no, that's all right. I, gee, I, don't, I, I don't know what happened. Just careless, I guess. Yeah. Do you, uh... Do you live around here somewhere? Well, yes. Yes, I'm Dalton. Um, three blocks up. What's your name? Carla. Carla Monty. Why are you asking? How long have you worked here, Carla? About a year. Do many teenagers hang out here? What do you mean? Kids, 17, 18, 19. Do many of them come in here for coffee, hamburgers? Well, sometimes, yeah. I've never noticed much. Know any of them? No, no, no. I don't know any of their names. Are you sure? I don't ask them their names. Did I ask you your name? It's Dollar, Johnny Dollar. Well, I still didn't ask you. If you want to tell me your... What are you scared of, Carla? Nothing. I'm not scared. You're not? Of course not. Why would I be scared? For the same reason your boss is, Red Weller. He was scared when he talked to me this afternoon and when he phoned me later. I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, yes, you do. That's why he didn't come to my hotel. He was afraid to. And why did you drop that silverware when I told you who I am? Because you're scared half to death. No. What's the matter with you people down here? What are you doing, crawling into a hole because a half-grown gang of hoodlums starts throwing their weight around? You don't understand. Then suppose you tell me about it. Do you think that's any kind of an answer in the long run? To pull the covers up over your eyes and let them do as they please and just keep hoping they'll leave you alone? All you're doing is making things worse. No, you don't know how it is. You don't have to live here. No, no, I don't have to live here, but I know how it is. Because I've seen it in other places where the mobs manage to take over. And if you let it happen here, then you'll really have something to be scared of. Maybe, maybe they've already taken over. Who? Oh. A bunch of kids with a gripe on, running in packs so they feel safe? Is that the kind of mob you mean, Carla? No. They're not a mob yet, but they will be if they're not stopped. It seems to me you'd have some sense of responsibility to them, if nobody else. Maybe if other people had a sense of responsibility, kids wouldn't have to grow up in a place like this. Have you ever thought of that, Mr. Dollar? Yeah, yeah, I've thought of it. But it doesn't hold water. I mean, you'd think so if you lived here. All right, so it's a slum district. And sure, these kids start out with a strike on them. But that's a pretty weak excuse for joining up at criminal bands and terrorizing a whole neighborhood. For slugging people and looting warehouses. Yes, yes, I know. Most of them find other answers. It's only a small minority that turns to crime. But if you let them get away with it, others will join them and they'll grow until finally it's too late. Well, Carla, still nothing to tell me? I can't. I just can't. I see. Well, there's a quarter for the coffee. Keep the change. Good night, Carla. Wait. Yeah? Mr. Dollar, suppose... Suppose I, I knew someone who, who might be able to help you. I mean, I mean, who might know something about the robbery. Innocently, of course. Uh, if you talk to this person and, uh, and they agree to help you... Could you, well, could you keep them out of it? Depends on the circumstances. I do all I could, that much I promise. I don't know. I'm not sure. You're not sure of what? Of you. Oh, I, I know better when I stop and think, but I've lived in this neighborhood too long. Lived with these people and... and... I'm bound by the law like any other citizen. 
And I won't break it to help somebody cover up a criminal act. But I figure it's up to me sometimes to decide whether a thing is a criminal act. And if a person seems to deserve it, well, I can be pretty lenient. You promise? What you just said? Yes, I promise. I've got to trust you. I've got to trust someone. Do you know such a person, Carla? Yes. Do you know where to find them? I think so. Well, I'm sure they'll be at one of two or three places. Not very far from here. And who is this person? Someone who grew up around here. A boy. Nineteen. What boy? My brother. Expense account item seven, two dollars and seventy cents taxi. We went first to Carla's apartment where she lived with her brother, but there was no one there. Then we checked out a drive in a few blocks away, a teenage hangout. No luck. Finally, we tried a pool hall down south of the yards, just off Alameda Street. It was our last hope. I know he comes here. It's not a good place for him, but a lot of the other kids do too. And he wants to belong. Yeah, sure. Everybody does, in one way or another. Oh, gosh, it'd have been different if our folks had lived, but uh, our boy just won't take orders from his sister. Yeah, I know. Go ahead. Thanks. Gosh, let's see. Well, if he's not here, then I just don't know where he... Oh, wait. There he is. Down near the corner. The one with the dark curly hair. All right. Come on. Take it easy. Just tell him I'm a friend of yours and you want to talk to him. We'll get him off to one side. Well, whatever you say. Eddie! Yeah? Well, for the... What are you doing here, Carla? Eddie, Eddie, this is Mr. Dollar. A friend of mine. We were... I wonder if we could talk to you for a moment. What about? Well, You just... know better than to come in a joint like this. But I want to talk to you, Eddie. Well, you can talk to me at home. Now. Go on, get her out of here, will you, mister? It might be a good idea if you listen to her first. I thought it was her that wanted to talk to me. Go on, get her out of here. All right, if you'll go with us. What for? I like it here. It's a nice place. Yeah? At least it's better than San Quentin. What are you talking about? A warehouse robbery, $100,000 worth of furs. I understand you may know something about it. Innocently, of course. I thought you said this guy was a friend of yours. Well, that's right, Eddie. He's just... Who is he? He's an insurance investigator. Oh, so that's the pitch. He's promised to help, Eddie. If, if you'll tell him whatever you know, he'll protect Knock you. Knock it off, get... Carla. Now, look, mister. I don't know nothing about nothing. I never even heard of no fur robbery. So take her with you and get out of here. This may be your last chance to get off before the boat sinks, Eddie. You're not leaving, huh? All right, then I'll leave. Eddie! Let him go. We can't force him to talk. I don't know, Mr. Dollar. I don't understand him. I do. Item 8, 10 cents, phone call from the pool hall to Lieutenant Garcia at police headquarters. He said there was no change in Albert Chrisman's condition yet. He was still holding on and he still hadn't talked. But there had been another new development, a big one. And when I joined Carla in the taxi outside, she knew it by the look on my face. What's wrong, Mr. Dollar? Now look, how sure are you that your brother wasn't mixed up in that robbery? Well, I... I want the truth. I... I'm afraid he was mixed up in it. Then brace yourself, Carla. Your boss, Red Weller, who was going to tell me what he knew about it, was found murdered in an alley an hour ago. Here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a lonely, broken-hearted girl, a blood-stained shirt, and a fight with a cornered rat. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours 
truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. Nineteen fifty-six. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Part two of this story, and it is not a pretty story at all. Uh, thank you for tuning in to Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Come visit my web page, ClassicRadio.stream, where you can stream our shows, learn about building a classic radio collection of your own. You can find lists of places where our shows are available for download via podcast, and you can also uh, contact me. You can also buy me a coffee. The buy me a coffee money helps us to acquire additional classic radio collections and also helps us maintain our distribution channels. That's at classicradio.stream, classicradio.stream. Thanks for making us a part of your day. Thank this station, support their advertisers, and the best thing you can do is tell all your friends the greatest radio shows of all time are right here at this spot on the dial. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox right here on your favorite radio station.